Well, good morning and welcome to People's Baptist Church. I hope that you have a having a great day. I hope you had a great week. And I am so excited about what God is doing in our in our lives. We're living in exciting times. I mean, this is what we're going through with the COVID-19 and, uh, and all that's going on in our country and around the world even. It is, uh, it, it, it is just exciting times for a believer. You say, why is it exciting times for a believer? Because it should bring us to a place where it shakes the things in us that aren't of God. And focus our attention on those things that are of God. And boy, I tell you what, I'm looking for God to do some great things, and I hope you are too. And uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and we'll get started in our service. Father, we do thank you so much for your good grace and mercy. And Lord, I pray, God, that you would just help us. Oh, Lord, I pray that your anointing would be upon this service, and your presence will be felt even for those that are sitting and listening and watching. I pray that you'll calm the circumstances around each person that is, that, that is uh, viewing this. And Lord, that you would help us to focus on thy word. And Lord, I pray you'll bless as we sing songs of praise to you and lift up your name. We love you and thank you for all you do. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now the Beechers are going to be singing for us, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Amen. Oh, four thousand tongues to sing. Well, just a few announcements. I want to. I just want to send out a great thank you for um, Brother Bill and Brother uh, and Brother uh, Vernon. Uh, we were having some lighting difficulties. Uh, we thought that we were going to be able to use the lights that we set up and and uh, get it all. Uh, all lit up and everything real quick, but we had some difficulties, and they stayed up here till late, late last night trying to, trying to get it all worked out, and and we're able to get it just where we were able to have lights for today. So uh, I want to say thank you for for the time that you put in to be make sure that we'd be able to live stream today, and what a blessing y'all are to the church. Uh, continue to pray for our church. We're, we're, we're still planning on uh, June 7th to open up. And uh, we will be having a, another missionary that will be with us on June 7th, who will be uh, David Wheats. He'll be teaching on how to evangelize the Jehovah's Witnesses. And uh, he'll be teaching on that Sunday morning at 11. And then he'll be teaching again that Sunday night. Now, we're only, we're only going to be opening up having one service, which will be 
Sunday morning service at 11 o'clock. Uh, Lord willing, if nothing else, uh, if, you know, if we don't have another crisis come through. And uh, so we'll be meeting on June 7th. And uh, we'll be sending out information concerning uh, what to expect when you get here and uh, how things will be operating. So please be in, uh, looking for that in your email. We'll try to get that out sometime this coming week. That way you'll have some time to look over it and ask any questions that you need to ask. Uh, also, uh, please uh, use your prayer your prayer list that's been going out and uh, continue to pray for those that are on it. And uh, if I want to make this announcement too, if there's something on there that you put on there that no longer needs to be prayed for, uh, please contact uh, Miss Jeanette and and let her know, or or uh, Miss Lynn, and let them know. That way, they can take them off the prayer list or or add it to the praise. Uh, so we can see God's hand working in those things. But uh, please be in prayer for for uh, the services that are coming and for our country and uh, for um, our, 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 you know, opening up of things that um, that the Lord would just continue to bless and, and watch over us and protect us and uh, just have his will in our lives. That he'll use this to draw us closer to him amen so remember to pray for those things uh continue to pray for our missionaries i was reading missionary prayer letters this morning and uh, one of the things that is really stressed is uh, at this time especially in the the concern of uh the loss of jobs and things like that that um, the missionaries are they're still on the field and uh i want you to pray for those that uh that are directors that the Lord would allow them to be able to go and to help raise more support for those who lose support during this time that uh, God would open up that door uh, for the directors to be able to share the the, the gospel especially now that many churches are ha having their first services today I know Corinth Baptist is I know that uh, Berean Baptist is and there's a uh, in Ellenwood Georgia and uh, there's a lot of churches that are opening up uh, today. Uh, pray for them that the Lord will bless and uh, that, um, that their services will go good. And uh, pray that there will not be some, some major uproar concerning those things in the, in the testimonies of, the, of those churches. So uh, let's continue to pray for those things that are taking place and for wisdom concerning our leaders. Amen. We, the leaders of our, our country need wisdom. We need to pray that God would take out the ones that are, are deceitful and wicked, that have, that, that have no, no thought for nothing but money and for their own selves. Uh, and I, I know that everybody in politics is not a Christian. But I'll tell you what, everybody in politics ought to be for the people, and they're not. And we need to pray that God would give us wisdom, especially in the elections coming up, that we would look for those that have the beliefs that we have, and we would vote for them, support them, and help them to get elected. So please be in prayer for these things as we're praying for the, the, the things that are going on in our world today. Amen. Now, the Beachams are going to be singing for us. Jesus is the sweetest name I know. Ain't that a truth? Amen. <clears throat> Jesus is the sweetest name I know, and he's just the same as his lovely name, and that's the reason why I love him so. Oh, Jesus is the sweetest name I know. There have been names that I have loved to hear But never has there been a name so dear To this 
this heart of mine as the name divine the precious precious name of Jesus Jesus is the sweetest name I know and he's just the same as his lovely name and that's the reason why I the sweetest name I know. There is no name in earth or heaven above that we should give such honor and such love as the blessed name. Let us all acclaim that wondrous, glorious name of Jesus. Jesus is the sweetest name I know, and he's just the same as his lovely name. And that's the reason why I love him so. The sweetest name I know And someday I shall see him face to face To thank and praise him for his wondrous grace Which he gave to me When he made me free The blessed Son of God called Jesus, Jesus is the sweetest name I know, and he's just the same as his lovely name, and that's the reason why I love him so. Oh, Jesus is the sweetest name I know. is the sweetest name I know. Amen. Isn't it the sweetest name you know? What a wonderful, wonderful name, the name of Jesus. Now I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Matthew chapter number 7. Matthew chapter number 7. And as you're turning there, I want you to realize that this is the end of the Sermon on the Mount. This is the, the climax, you could say. Where Jesus had spent the last two chapters, chapter 5 and chapter 6, and chapter 7 even, preaching to the people instructing the people, defining, if you would, Christianity, defining what it means to be saved, defining what it is to follow Him. And then in chapter number 7, we have those chilling words, those chilling words by which we hope to never hear, those chilling words by which Many will hear in that day. That day of judgment, that day of reckoning. In verse number 21 of chapter number 7, it says this right here. It says, Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doth the will of of my Father. Well, you ought to underline that in your Bible. Which is in heaven. Many will say unto me that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils? And in thy name 
done many wonderful works. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. What chilling words these are. For someone to be involved in the Lord... He, he, he claims in this verse as it, they'll come to him saying, I know you, Lord. I know of you. I, I've, I've, I've even ministered for you. And yet, the Lord never knew them. What chilling words. Proverbs tells us that in chapter number 30 and verse number 12 says there's a generation that are pure in their own eyes and yet is not washed from their iniquities or their filthiness. Romans chapter 10 verse 2 says this right here. Paul says, I bear them record that they had a zeal of God but not according to knowledge. Isn't that what Paul said about himself even? That he was zealous for the things of God, but he did not know Christ. Multitude of people in our society today, and multitudes that have been in past have been in religion. Yet, religion carries no hope for entering the kingdom. We see this example in in John chapter number 2 and verse number 23 and verse number 25. If you've been with us on Sunday night, you know what I'm talking about because I made sure that we brought this out. They were at the feast, uh, the Passover feast. and, And it says in verse number 23, it says that many believed in his name. When they saw the miracles. Which he did. But verse number 24 says. But Jesus did not commit himself. Unto them. I looked up that word commit. In Strong's light. It says. It says that. Let me back up for just a second. It says to believe, to trust in, to to hold in belief, but yet it says he did not commit. He did not believe in their belief. Because he knew all men. Jesus knows us. He knows what's in us. He knows what we're thinking. He knows our hearts. He knows our motives. He knows where we're really at in our spiritualness. He knows where we're really at concerning our belief. Our dedication. He even backed up in that same verse and said that that we just read those chilling words. He said, But he that doth the will of my Father which is in heaven. That is the key. That is the dividing factor in believing. It's not just knowing. The Bible says the devils know and fear and tremble, but they're not saved. Neither can they be. Jesus knew their heart. Apart from Jesus... 
There is no hope for heaven. For Jesus said in John chapter number 14, in verse number 6, He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. In Acts 4, 12, it says this right here. It says, neither is there salvation in any other name, for there is none other name given uh, none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. That all familiar verse, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. The conversion of the heart mentioned in Romans chapter number 10, verse number 9, that... If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and shalt believe in thine heart that God had raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. There's no hope for those who don't believe in the gospel. There's no hope for those that don't trust in Jesus. There's no hope for those that do not understand the cross and the resurrection. This text here that we see declares that there are those they call him Lord, but never really knew him. It's a sad, sad thing to be religious and lost. I see it all around me. We have preached for the last 50 years such an easy believism that the truth has been washed away. Let me see how many we can have saved in our revival. All you have to do is come down and pray this prayer. Can I tell you, it's much more than just that. In Matthew chapter number 7 we just read the end part of this text. Let us start back at the beginning of verse number 13 and watch and see what he says. In verse 13, he, he says, Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thither, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life. And few, you ought to underline that, few there be that find it. Beware of false prophets, which come unto you in sheep's clothing, in inward they are ravaging wolves. You shall know them by their fruit. Do men gather grapes of thorns and figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. But a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth Evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree bringeth forth not fruit, uh, not forth good fruit, is hewn down and cast into the fire. Whereby, wherefore, by their fruit shall you know them. Not every man, reading what we read before in our text, not every man that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, 
shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he that doth the will of the Father, which is in heaven, many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Have a, and in thy name cast out devils? And in thy name did done many wonderful works? And then I will put, put, uh, for, profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house on a rock. And the rains descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was a founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these things of mine and doeth them not, I shall liken unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rains descended, and the floods came, and the winds beat, and blowed, and beat upon the house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. The theme of this is not heaven and hell. The theme of this is heaven. He describes Two directions which are preached to go towards heaven. If you look, you'll see that these that are mentioned as those that he did not know knew him as Lord. He describes those by which deceived them in the way that they were to go as false prophets, ravaging wolves. The works that are given here are works by which we would say would be that of the apostles. Casting out devils, prophesying, doing mighty works. The the theme here is the directions by which we're led. I know many of us know people that are in false religions who are trusting in different things to get into heaven. We know of different religions that visit our doors or we have contact with in in the things that they teach and preach. But I want us to look at just a few things concerning This, these verses. And the theme by which I would like to preach is which way to heaven? Let's pray. Father, I ask, Lord, that you'll help me. Oh, God, what a time we're living in. Lord, you've shaken us. Now, Lord, I pray that you'll open our eyes to see truth in thy word. Lord, I'm not here to preach to make people doubt, but to confirm. Lord, your word is true. And if we cannot find comfort and stability, if we hear a message that that focuses on salvation at its purest form, preached by your own lips, and it makes us mad and angry inside, frustrated with what we're hearing. Oh God, is there something wrong with what's being said? Or something wrong with our own hearts? 
Lord, help us to see. You've asked us in your word to, to search ourselves to find if we be in the faith. For your word declares what is of you and what is not. Lord, make clear today. Make straight the things that may be crooked. Let thy spirit have their liberty in every word that's uttered. Lord, I'll praise you. For I am unworthy to stand and speak thy word. But because of thy calling, Lord, I am here. I pray, God, that you would use me. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to look at verses 13 and 14. There's so much in these verses that we've just read, that there's no way that I could preach it all. But I want you to see here that he enters into a command. He says, enter ye in the straight gate. That is not a suggestion there. That is a command that he has given at the end of his preaching. He said, what I've told you, now it's time for you to choose. Enter in the straight gate. As one preacher said, it's time to make up your mind. The Sermon on the Mount was a contrast between religion, a true religion, and Judaism. But it is not only that today for us, it is a contrast between all religion and true religion. Of what is the way? It says there's two possibilities given here. One involves your work, your effort, your goodness, your righteousness to please God. The other relies simply on that in you is not sufficient, nor has anything capable of pleasing God. So these two kinds of religion is what we face in our lives today. The Sermon on the Mount doesn't attack the sins of, of those people that were there. It, it attacked their motive and their form of worship. Jesus taught against their praying, taught against their giving, their service in the temple, and their worship. He started off in Matthew chapter number 5 and verse number 3 and said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That word poor there means to be bankrupt. To have no means whatsoever. Jesus teaches them that they are spiritually bankrupt. But I want you to see this. He said that those that realize that they're spiritually bankrupt are blessed. Because when you can realize that, your eyes are being opened to truth. It reveals us to what God has done to save us when we realize ourselves to be spiritually bankrupt. He ends this sermon with this command, enter ye in the straight gate. There's two groups that are notified or viewed here. I'm going to go down and, 
And I want you to see how he reveals these throughout all that we read. There's two gates, the straight and the wide. There's two ways, the broad and the narrow. There's two groups, the many and the few. There's two trees, good and corrupt. There's two fruits, good and bad. There's two behaviors, the sayers and the doers. There's two buildings, uh, builders, the wise and the foolish. There's two foundations, the rock and the sand. There's two houses, one is steadfast, and the other falls. He clearly contrasts all religion in these groups. That there's not many ways, but one narrow way, or one broad way. I want us to look just for a few minutes on the first one. I hope one day to go through and preach them all. But there's no way that it is possible to do so today. <laughs> Maybe we'll have a series on them. But in Matthew chapter number 13, he says, Enter ye in the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many they be which go in thither. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leads unto life. And few there be that find it. Now I want you to see the focus of these roads. The road that goes to heaven. First of all, you must choose to enter it. You must choose to take it. It's interesting to me... Uh, as I was growing in the, the life of my Christianity, I, I picked up and read Pilgrim's Progress. Wonderful book. But the viewpoint there was that there was one road that was very easy to travel. One road there that was very luxurious in the way that it looked. Easy going. No kinds of, of uh, friction, no, no hardness, no suffering, just beauty and delight. On that road, you didn't have to worry about doctrine. You didn't have to worry about truth or having your feelings heard. Or it was just come as you are, be, be who you are, and let's just... Worship together. But on the other side of the fence, there was another path. This path, it was rocky and rough. And it was tight and harsh. And it was rugged and rough. As they went... There is one pathway to enter in. There's one theme by which it's all connected. We know that it's the name of Jesus, but I want you to see what Jesus really represents in all that he is. Listen to what 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 8 says. It says, the flaming fire taketh vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Can I tell you that by this gate is the way that 
We must enter that straight way. There's no other way in. There may be two directions, but there's only one gate that leads to heaven. Jesus said in, John, in the book of John, he says, I am the door. I am the light. I am the life. I am the truth. And no man comes to the Father but by me. In John 1, 12, it says this right here. It says, but as many as receive him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. There's no other way besides Christ. In Ephesians chapter number 1, in verse number 13, it says this right here. It says, in whom ye also trusted. After that, ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in, in whom also after that ye believe, ye were sealed with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of promise. There is no other Redeemer. There is no other salvation. There is no other sacrifice for sin that you must go through to get to heaven. It is a straight gate. It is a narrow path. It is not wild and willy in any way you want to do. But can I tell you, this gate comes with separation. It may cost you your relationships. It, it will cost you the world. It must be a personal decision. It is not a collective experience. We're not saved because of our friends or our parents or because we grew up in church. Luke chapter 14 and verse number 26 says this right here. It says, if any man come, uh, come to me, and hate not his father and his mother and his wife and his children and brethren and sister. Yea, and his own life. Also, he cannot be my disciple. All human relationship has to be set aside. It the children of Israel, they were listening to Jesus at this time, had in their mind, because of Abraham and them being the children of Abraham, that they were destined for heaven. They had circumcision. They had the law of God. They had the sacraments. They had, they had the sacrifices. But yet they knew not God in wisdom and knowledge. Paul described his life in, in Philippians chapter number 3. He said that he was circumcised of the eighth day, the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, uh, a Hebrew of Hebrews, touching the law, uh, a Pharisee concerning seal, persecuted the church, tur touching righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. He described himself as one that was zealous for God. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. You see the struggle. He was on that broad path, that, that broad way. He was, he was in, the, in the cream of the crop of those by which were beneficial to that way. Some say he was even on the path of being the lead of all the Pharisees chief but it came with sacrifice after his conversion 
they sought his life. Why? Why did they seek his life? Because there was a drastic change in what he believed. Listen, we can't hold on to the old things of the world and of our life and think that we're going to live for God. There's a drastic change that takes place. That brings me to the second point. It's hard to put this in words. It really is because we don't believe in worship salvation. But I want you to know something, that, that entering in in salvation is not something that's easy. It's a hardship. So what do you mean, Brother David? Do you like denying yourself? I have even put it this way. Do you even know what it means to deny yourself? To really deny yourself, to put yourself in a slavery position underneath somebody else. Where your rights are totally taken away and you rely nothing more but on their word. That is what we're talking about. That is not an easy thing to do. It's not an easy decision to come to because we are not people that willfully want to place ourselves in that position. That's why the Bible says, few there be that find it. See, we're living in a society today where we have, where, where we can have God and we can have our salvation and we can have our freedom to do our sin and not have any liberty. And here's, here's the banner that we fly it under. I'm only human. I'm not perfect. We're not perfect. And we fly our sin under that great banner of not being perfect in our flesh, and nothing can stop that. Boy, I would challenge you to read chapters, Romans chapter 6 and through chapter 8. And not look at it at eyes of glassed over of what you desire in your life, but what it means to lose your life. Being a Christian is not something that's easy. It is a rough road because I have to live for Christ. It's not the easy way. It means that I must submit when I don't want to. I must speak when I should feel like that I should not. Enter in this straight way. In Luke chapter number 13, in verse number 14, it says, Straight, enter in, I'm sorry, Luke chapter number 13, verse number 24, it says, Strive to enter in the straight gate. That, that word strive means to push because of the fact that it's difficult to go through. It's becoming that by what we are not. And can I tell you that is a difficulty. When God regenerates us to become that by what we were unaccustomed of being. That's why it's a straight. That's why it's narrow. It's difficult, to, it's difficult for us to hear the truth and to apply it in our lives and to live the Word of God, but yet 
it is that by what he used to declare the difference between those that worked iniquity and those that were saved. In Luke chapter 16, in verse number 16, listen to what it says. It says, The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presses into it. Have you ever tried to put something in something that, was, that didn't fit? I'll tell you a little story. I was changing out a grommet on a car park. And this grommet had to be pressed in this hole. And the grommet was a really, really big compared to that hole. But yet it was the grommet that went in there. So I got me some grease. And I greased that thing out real good. And I got to pushing and shoving. And boy, the thing I was pushing on moved. And, and I cut my hand. And, and then I had, to get, I had to think, how am I going to get this grommet that's bigger than this hole inside there? I said, I'm going to have to press it in. So I called up my friend, Brother Mark Pewson, and I said, hey, do you have a press? He said, yeah, come on over. So I took it over to the press. Now, don't you see this? And I put that thing on that press, and I started cranking it down. You know what that grommet did? It flared out. It had to be narrowed down. So I put it in a funnel and I pushed it through that funnel to the place where it was l smaller than that hole into that hole and fitted it into the right place. And he said, Brother David, what does that got to do with Christianity? Can I tell you that we're fitting into a certain mold? You know what that mold is? It's Jesus. Our lives are being led from salvation to the end of our life to be like Christ. And we're pressed in that direction. It's not an easy life. It's not a prosperous life. It is a self-denying life. Isaiah puts it like this. In verse number 55, I mean chapter number 55, verse number 7, it says, Let the wicked forsake their way, his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. That's what it's about. Yet we'll strive with our desires. We'll strive with, with our will. We'll strive with our way. Children rebel against their parents. Grown men strive to be successful in this world. We look and we say in ourselves, we've got to meet the need of our family, so we must be successful. And yet, true success is humbly finding ourselves serving rightly the Son of God. It's difficult to leave behind ourselves and to choose Him. Yet that is the straight gate. Yet that is the narrow way. 
Luke chapter 9, verse number 23 says this right here. It says, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Jeremiah 29, 13 says this right here. And ye, ye, ye shall seek me and find me when you have searched me with all your heart. The rich young ruler, I mean, the rich young man, he's, he is a prime example of this. He came to Jesus wanting to serve him, and he, he said, what must I do to be saved? And he went through that he kept the law, and Jesus looked at him in, Ma in Mark chapter number 10, verse number 21, and said, one thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell what." Soever thou hast, and give it to the poor, and thou shalt have treasures in heaven, and come take up the cross and follow me. But look what happened. Verse number 22. He was sad at that saying, and went away grievous, for he had great possessions. Listen, we're not willing to give ourselves. We're not going to be willing to give what we've got. God doesn't want your house. He doesn't want your bank account. He doesn't want your, your car. He wants you. Because he knows when he has you, he has it all. I know that we're getting very lengthy in what we're talking about. But I, I want to press on because we're not through yet. <laughs> we, we mu it's a hard way, but I want you to see we, can't, we must enter that gate empty. We, we can't take things with us. There's no room for it. The, 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 the way is narrow. It's tight. When it talks about it being narrow, it is talking about it being so thin that you have to suck in to get through. You ever had to do that? The older I get, the more I got to suck. Amen? But I, I'm telling you, it's talking about and maneuvering your body in the way of the shape of what it is, that nothing else will fit through but you. We've got to leave our pride. We've got to leave our desires. We've got to leave our careers. And we have to focus on him. He wants it all. Listen to what he says. Luke chapter 14, verses number 27. He says this right here. He said, and whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me is not worthy or cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and considereth the cost where he must, uh, that whether he had sufficient to finish. Listen, he, he's telling us that this is going to cost us and salvation is something that we think is just, I'm going to grab it. I got it. And now I'm going to go about my life just the way it was. Can I tell you that that is a broad way of thinking. And the Bible does not teach it. It is a narrow way. It is a narrow path. And we cannot enter it with anything 
any baggage, any thoughts of our own. It is total submission to Jesus. He becomes our Lord. He becomes our master. He is that one that we serve. And him alone. Not self-will. Not worldly focused. But humbly submitted. That is the straight gate. That is the narrow path. What is the road you're on today? What is your direction? I hope that the Word of God is the definer of your path. Let's pray. Father, I thank you and ask, Lord, that you would help me. Oh, God, help me to receive your word, to live it, to preach it. Well, Lord, I pray for those that are out there that may be watching. Lord, you have told us to examine ourselves. And we are too often to make sure that we're walking according to our faith. According to you. Lord I pray God. If there be one. That's walking the broad path. It's been deceived Lord. By false prophets and teachers. The way that many are going. Lord I pray that you'll open their eyes to see. He'll bring salvation, true salvation. That that day, when they see you, Lord, you won't say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. You'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. I pray you'll bless and have your will. In Jesus' name, amen. The Beechams are going to be singing for us. Amen. I hope that you'll have a wonderful day. And I want to invite you to come back tonight. And at 6 o'clock, we're going to be going through the book of John. And we'll be finishing up chapter 9. And going, and then we'll be headed to chapter number 10. So I hope, to see, hope you'll be back with us. And I hope you have a great day. May the Lord bless you.